Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, job crafting and bringing your whole self to work with Rob Baker. We talk about how you should focus on doing fun things where you don't know what the outcome will be, crafting his own jobs and working flexibly before it was fashionable, and sacking enough people to get his HR hands dirty. Unsurprisingly, he didn't enjoy this. Rob is a specialist in bringing positive psychology to life within organisations. He is the founder and chief positive deviant of Tailored Thinking, a leading evidence-based positive psychology, well-being and HR consultancy. Rob's work, ideas and research on how people can personalise work and bring their whole and best selves to the workplace have been presented at academic and professional conferences around the globe. He is the author of Personalisation at Work, published by Kogan Page. Rob continues to research and collaborate with academics from the University of Melbourne Centre of Positive Psychology and is a Chartered Fellow of the CIPD and a Chartered Fellow of the Australian HR Institute. An avid runner, Rob has previously competed on an international stage, having represented Great Britain in mountain running and orienteering. These days, Rob runs and cycles purely for fun and reflection and enjoys outdoor miss adventures with his family in Durham. Okay, so thank you ever so much, Rob, for joining us on a very beautiful, still winter morning, afternoon, Mm. morning, it's morning (laughs) in Newcastle. So did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? No, I said it was a short answer to this question. No, I didn't know (laughs) what I wanted to do. I do remember, though, um, at school doing some kind of assessment Mm -hmm. where you had to kind of fill in some boxes. I think this was Mm pre-computers to doing it. So I think I remember the tick box. Um, I remember doing it. I don't remember kind of how I got the results, but I do remember the results was that I was going to be an outdoor pursuits instructor, which actually sounds quite cool. And I was thinking about it on the way here. It still sounds pretty cool, actually, yeah. in terms of <laughs> something to do, um, in terms of um, getting outside, supporting other people to do some kind of fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of energetic, uh, which is something that I'm kind of really interested in into sport. And um you're having some adventures so i think that still sounds quite good actually so maybe maybe i still got another kind of careers in me so that's maybe something i would do <laughs> and but on reflection as well it, it made me think that the way i can kind of characterize some of the things that that i do and kind of want to encourage other people to do is around having their own kind of personal adventures and, mm. and doing by adventures i mean kind of doing things where you don't really know what the outcome is going to be but doing them because you think it's going to be fun or you're going to learn something and and also, by definition of that, maybe something that you're going to f- struggle with a little bit in terms of um, it's not necessarily going to come kind of easy to you. And no. that's, again, the outdoor pursuits, particularly when I think about those, I think of kind of climbing or kind of um, kind of kayaking or doing something, again, where you're not kind of having to challenge yourself and you're putting yourself against the kind of elements. And yeah. I suppose the elements aren't, aren't the aren't waves and rock faces, but kind of uh, businesses and people, uh, which is probably more, more complex and, and messy, I imagine. Yeah. As long as there's no heights involved, mm. I'm, I'm up for that. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with that newfound information, did uh, is the career's advice then, come on, Rob, that's not a real career, you need a job, not a... Or what did you do with that information? Well, well it's funny, I had it, but I never could have quite thought that's what I was going to That's what I was going to do, mm. if that makes sense. So I just thought, well, that was, that's kind of interesting. Other people have kind of had architect or um, doctor or kind mm. of other things, and it was just like, that wasn't... Just it, it, it wasn't my result that I had. Um, I had probation officer. Probation officer. So you remember doing them as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And, uh, probation officer, speech therapist, and solicitor. Yeah. Wow. Well, and yeah, it's it's random. amazing the kind of the boxes that you kind of uh, that you can kind of put yeah. around people and how they kind of maybe shape kind of what you what you do. But I was I was quite happy with it. But throughout kind of school, I all my kind of choices were kind of were trying to open up opportunities rather than narrow them down because I never really thought that's exactly what I wanted to do mm. other than being able to kind of pursue my sports at the highest level that I possibly could so I was a kind of um, very keen runner as I still am but mm. as a as a junior um, and I went here mm-hmm. and uh, fell runner and I was lucky enough to kind of compete internationally at the kind of like sports from an early age and so it was something that I always knew that I, that's something I wanted to kind of, I didn't want work to get in the way of that. Mm. But we weren't kind of, this was pre, 
um, kind of professional sports. Not that there's many kind of professional orienteers kind of anyway. It's not the <laughs> thing you do to kind of um, become rich and famous. Mm-hmm. But it was something that I always wanted to think about how I could do do work that I thought was kind of fun and fulfilling, but but actually just enabled me to kind of do the stuff that was really mattered to me, which was kind of sport of volunteering. <laughs> Running up and down mountains and through forests. Yeah, exactly. And stuff. I, with a map, yeah. yeah. And uh, who, who wouldn't want to do that? Oh. And um <laughs> pursue that and um we had a conversation um before you know just before we started this around that took kind of those those uh, sport took me to opportunities to kind of um lots of different places mm. and meet lots of kind of good friends as well and mm. so it was something that was really important to, to, to my life and still still is so my best friends are ones that i met when i was competing and um, kind of uh, chris who's from from, from the midlands and mm. anthony from edinburgh when we were kind of 12, 13, mm. um, and they're still my kind of best friends today. I was kind of best, oh. best man at their wedding, mm. and Anthony's son now is just um, turned 14. So he's kind of, we're saying to him, be careful who you're kind of meeting when at those orienteering competitions that he's doing himself now, because mm-hmm. you, you might be stuck with these people for the rest of your, <laughs> the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> and, and so it's something that I've kind of been really lucky to do. And again, from a work perspective, I've always... Every single job I've ever had, at some point I've gone part time, could have worked flexibly, mm-hmm. and that's to enable me to pursue other 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 things. So that's been when I was kind of at PwC, I could have was enabled me to kind of spend more time training effectively. And mm-hmm. when I was working with a joint venture with British Telecom and Brother and Borough Council, same thing. I worked four days, um, so I could have spend a day a week kind of train extra training mm-hmm. or travelling. Um, and then since then it's been changed to kind of actually spending time with the kids or, um, and helping out there. So it's always kind of, I've always seen work not as something that's fixed. I've tried to kind of flex it a little bit around enabling a bit more time to spend doing the things that I um, enjoy doing but also matter to me. So that's mm. something I've always kind of tried to do. And it was only when I was presenting at a conference last week, not only last week, sorry, last year on kind of flexible working that I realized, oh, I've, I've done this without re- kind of realizing doing it deliberately, if that mm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's just something I've kind of always kind of done. Mm. Yeah. It's very, it's very enlightened in many ways, isn't it? Because we often... I'd like, um, to, I'd like to say it's very nice, but I wouldn't say it's enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that's just happened. But yeah, I, I'll take well, enlightened. I, I suppose from the perspective of, often we'll say, well, I've got this job. I work so many, I'll work five days a week. I do X number of hours, 50 hours, whatever it might be. And then you try and fit things around while well, I'm out of office or I'm commuting. So I know that I can't do anything until six, seven at night. But flipping it on its head and saying, well, how can I make the work fit into what I'm really enjoying? I think that's a, a very different way of looking at, at things of life. Of See where I'm going with that? Well, yeah, it's, I think it's really <clears throat> fairly... It's only fairly recent that flexible working is, is kind of fashionable, I suppose. <coughs> You know the fact that you've been doing it most of your career, and you've sort of almost got away with it. Well, I think that's it. I, mean, I like saying I'm a trendsetter, but that's not the, the case. I th- and I think with all these things that I've had to kind of, it's never been, it's not been something I've negotiated from day one. Although you might do now with a bit more kind of confidence, mm. um, mm. Uh, and probably a bit of acceptance within within organisations. But I've always kind of worked full time, kind of got trust and respect, and then said, look, can I, can I, can I kind of craft or change my role slightly to. Um, create more time and space I think the interesting thing about the four days is that although it provided me a kind of day off effectively to do things and I think this is still the case today Mm. is that we're not very good in workplaces actually kind of actually mapping out what that Mm. could have for reducing the workload somehow or or reframing it in a way that actually enables people to do kind of um, a great four days without having to worry about them they're not actually working Full time, if that makes sense, and I, in a way, I think me even saying full time is not particularly helpful because it kind of full time assumes that's the norm, yeah. and actually, I don't think it needs to be. And one of the things that I um kind of talked about in the in the book, and uh, and that we'll kind of maybe we talk about is around actually what would happen if we didn't over design overfill jobs. So we spend a lot of time in in work uh, designing work around 40 hours a week or 35 hours, etc., and, f- and feeling we've got to fill that up mm-hmm. effectively. And then when you come to kind of work flexibly you've got to take things off and pick that apart and that or squash things down and that's mm. always kind of really hard to do yeah. um, and also both from a technical point of view in terms of actually you've got to reallocate those those tasks but also from a mental point of view you're kind of like well I'm not really doing my proper job mm. of what this would be but if we all design started designing jobs on maybe three days a week or something mm. 
and saying that's the core of a job and then built up from there it gave every, it could give everyone a bit of an opportunity to create be more flexible in terms of how they um do their job b maybe not take on additional duties if you wanted to work kind of mm-hmm. flexibly or um kind of c maybe do your core job and then say actually i'm interested in learning about a b or c or something so kind of have some more kind of experiments in terms of the work that people mm-hmm. the work that people do um so that's the kind of thing i, th- I think how you might could change in the future mm-hmm. um but i don't think at the moment in time we've quite got the kind of that that kind of element of flexibility quite quite right no, there's a lot of presenteeism as well isn't there that, yeah. you know if you're not seen you're not working and I am a big believer in the amount of time it takes to do a task will expand or shrink into the amount of time you've got to do the task. So if you've got five days, it'll take you five days. If you've got three days, it'll take you three days. It's it's, it's a law. It's one of those laws, but it's not Murphy's <laughs> law, but it's one of those ones. Yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely is. Um, and that makes complete sense to me. And mm. I think there's a tension sometimes with that is the, the kind of like, well, I'm not going to just, I'm just going to put that off because I know I'll deliver it at some point. So mm. there's a kind of... Mm-hmm. A trade-off with that um but i i do think that within workplaces as well they they can be which is where i spend most of my time mm. working and with the teams they can be kind of more design redesigned in a, in a more efficient more edifying more kind of interesting way mm-hmm. but that involves us changing kind of current paradigms which is difficult to yeah. to do so take us a little bit a couple of steps back and how you found yourself the the chief positive deviant of your own company? What was yeah. what was it about psychology that attracted you? Yeah, so my I was sort of talked about the kind of start um, was around kind of keeping my options open in terms mm. of being broad things, and so I didn't know what I wanted to do it um, kind of as a career or kind of specifically at university. But I was kind of really interested in in humans and kind of history, um, but also the kind of future and. and Kind of why people did the things that they did, so that mm. kind of psychology kind of um, was something that I was kind of interested in. And I studied at um, Loughborough University, so Loughborough again has got a very strong sporting kind of yes. category. So that's kind of the link there. Um, I would have loved to go to kind of Sheffield was my kind of the, the place to go as an orienteer, but I wasn't kind of predicted to get the grades, and I, I didn't get them mm. as, it, as it were to kind of go there. So Loughborough was my kind of second second choice. I was really happy there. And then in terms of my kind of career I again keeping the options open I was like I didn't know what I wanted to do so I applied for a kind of graduate scheme um, within PricewaterhouseCoopers and was lucky enough to get that in Leeds so again gradually I'm an Essex boy but I've <laughs> gradually moved north Yay. as it were <laughs> as it kind of got over time and learned loads there in terms of for five years as, a, as an HR consultant doing lots of different projects for change and transformation Paying reward, um, kind of restructures, kind of lots of things all over the kind of country. Some of it kind of internationally, mm. um, which was great as a as a as a kind of a young youngster. Was I was really lucky to work with a very supportive team. But one of the things that I found from from doing that is that I and again this is subsequently have learned that I've kind of picked up some probably quite perverse ideas of what a good day at work looks like or actually what kind of good looks like from a performance perspective because they were very kind of driven in terms of um kind of sales and outcomes um mm. lo- a lot of very long long hours culture very kind of responsive so people could be contacted mm. um or could all hours and expected to kind of drop everything and kind of travel to do to, to do things at kind of minutes notice and things and so that's i don't think that's that's kind of stayed with me saying that's what if you're if you're serious about a job that's what it looks like and i don't mm. think that's necessarily helpful mm. but i but in terms of my my experience i love the consultancy side of things going to businesses understanding how they worked and and feeling i could make a bit of a difference to that and actually applying some of my kind of ideas and knowledge to, to that or working with others to do that mm-hmm. but I wasn't doing my kind of I don't know HR qualifications when I was at PwC but I didn't get my hands dirty as an HR I hadn't sacked anyone mm-hmm. and basically as far as I was concerned <laughs> at that point in the time as an HR person if I hadn't sacked anyone I hadn't really mm-hmm. wasn't really couldn't really wear my kind of HR badge of honor yeah. so I was like okay how can I get my kind of hands a bit dirtier um, <laughs> and and uh, my next kind of project kind of certainly enabled me to do that and that was for working for the joint venture between British Telecom and Brother and Borough Council so mm. we that was leading a kind of transformation project with British Telecom invested kind of 30 million pounds in the council to kind of transform its services mm-hmm. um, with the expectation there'll be a kind of um, a return on investment of that in savings over the longer term mm-hmm. and my role was to support the kind of the kind of HR team bringing everyone together mm. and I learned kind of masses around 
um, trying to encourage and enable people to kind of get excited about this new, more efficient, more effective mm. way of working in a shared service center. When in reality, a lot of people were very happy working in their kind of individual teams where they've got good relationships with people and providing a different service. And so it was one around one of operational design, which was I was very comfortable with saying, I knew this was a good thing to do, mm. but actually bringing the hearts and minds of people with them was something that kind of I was was a difficult bit of the the aspect of it but we managed to we managed to get there and and again I learned a lot of them on the way and the kind of my 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 kind of hang up about not doing my kind of employee relations side of things of HR Mm. the second side of things came to fruition when I ended up leading the kind of the that side of the team for the council and the Nintendo service center so I could have basically spent uh, nine months just Kind of working with the team to manage all the kind of caseloads that came out of the council, and it was, um, as with many any organisation, there was lots of weird and wonderful kind of issues that the, the the team had to 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 deal with, which isn't probably suitable for this 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 podcast. No. And but um, but good exposure, good exposure, and good good um, interesting time. So that's so how many people did you sign? Oh wow! Well, I, I, <laughs> I didn't keep I didn't keep a score. I didn't keep a score. I didn't keep a score. <laughs> Um, enough to get his hands dirty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Enough to get his hands dirty. Enough to feel to, to practically apply my knowledge in this kind of in this approach. And it wasn't, but it, uh, really interestingly though, something I actually realised I hated. It wasn't like yeah. the, that kind of side of things in terms of the of, of looking at problems and fixing those issues and disciplinary sanctions and stuff. I could do it, and I was I was good at it from a from a kind of transactional and fairness point of view. But it was something that. I didn't enjoy it. certainly wasn't something I got excited about any day. No. Ooh, who are we going to sack this morning? <laughs> yeah, so it's one of those things sometimes you've got to be careful what you wish for, I yes. think, in terms, of, in, terms of, in terms of the approach. Um, and also the lack of flexibility and compassion and humanity you've got in all of these processes because mm. you've got to be fair and consistent. And I kind of get that balance, but some of the kind of circumstances you can kind of understand, but you also needed to be kind of consistent mm. in terms of how you applied the, the, the policies and stuff so it was, it was it was it was complex but the team was fun and it was something that was enjoyable and mm-hmm. coming back to the flexible working um or the flexibility and and, and, the, and the running side of things um was it was interesting in the fact that i was still doing the same amount of training as an orienteer so i was still trying to, to to kind of run make kind of international teams at this stage as i was at pwc but all I'd done is kind of with a job at uh, um, RBT is moved closer to home. So my commute was like half an hour. Sometimes I could do it on a bike or even run. Mm. And I got, that was probably the, the, my best I was running as an athlete, as an orienteer, was that time at Rotherham, mm. where I still enjoy the work equally. But all I'd done is actually taken away a, a two hour commute that I've been doing or kind of traveling and weekends work and this, these hours. And so it was one of these first times that could have really eye opening to me that really tangibly for me is that those kind of that additional sign of work, that commuting, the kind of the, the drudgery sometimes that's associated with work actually has an impact on health and well-being, which is like da da. It's not it's, it's not rocket science, but I could see it as a tangible difference in terms of my own, own performance. That was kind of interesting. Mm. And uh, kind of leaping forward from there, from rather I went to a uh, kind of forward thinking organisation um, at the University of Sheffield. So they were kind of really progressive from HR function, mm. did some actual HR kind of business partnering, which involved really supporting um, different areas of the university to kind of deal with kind of people issues. Mm-hmm. And, f- and they're kind of may- the way that I framed it was a really enabling the, the businesses to do what it wanted to with its people. And I was like, really fascinated about how I could do that make that happen and from Sheffield I was fortunate enough to be offered a job in Australia and University of Melbourne which mm. was fantastic and and Melbourne was kind of really positive experience for three things so first we had our son there so Finn was born when we were in Australia which was awesome mm-hmm. secondly from a, from a work perspective I got involved in a massive transformation and change project for the university so we there was 6,000 people at, in Melbourne 3,000 academics and 3,000 professional staff and I was involved in kind of restructuring the entire the professional services function. So again, coming back to this, this experience in Rotherham, mm. I thought actually there's some slightly different approaches that we can use here, which we, we did. Mm. And we learned a lot again from that pro- pro- process. It was very successful from a technical point of view, but we still hadn't nailed the people side of things. There were still things that we weren't quite getting right in terms of engaging people with the change. Mm. And I, so I kind of thought, well, I want to learn about this and understand that a bit more. And at Melbourne... I was had the opportunity to do some further further study. That was one of the reasons I, when I was negotiating my contract, I was saying, look, I wanted to, to do something. Would you sponsor me? And I thought I was going to do an MBA, 
but I just I just wasn't excited about it. So I was like, I'm looking for something else. And mm. positive psychology kind of popped up in Google. So mm. somehow it was my friend in this respect. Mm. Mm. Um, and I was like, well, this is fascinating. And it didn't exist as a concept when I studied psychology at mm. um, the turn of the decade. And it was like, well, okay, for positive, positive psychology. So it's a study of flourishing and positive outcomes mm. in terms of how people live fulfilling uh, lives in from from different perspectives so that could be from a work perspective that could be from an educational perspective you know um or kind of just life generally and i mm. just thought this is really kind of interesting and something i was kind of fascinated with so and melbourne had just um launched um a world-leading kind of center in positive psychology the year before which is quite handy mm. um, and just launched a master's program and so i was just very lucky to be accepted on the master's program the first year it was running Mm-hmm. And it just gave me massive exposure to some of the leading lights in um, positive psychology at the time, um, and it was just like, oh, this is fascinating. So I was I was really interested in, it and I was and I came across a concept called job crafting mm-hmm. there, and the um, job crafting is effectively saying that when people make changes to their proactively make changes to their work, so it's so they. Um, their work is a better reflection of themselves, their true selves, in terms of their strengths, their passions, their interests. Mm-hmm. They perform better. And it's like, well, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. But today, at that time, from a research perspective, there'd just been lots of people surveying people saying, do you job craft? And they'd be like, yes, I job craft, says James. And, and do you have positive outcomes on that? And yes, there are lots of positive outcomes. Mm-hmm. But there hadn't been many people actually thinking about can we encourage this or make this happen and the applied side mm. is something I'm, I'm really fascinated by and, mm-hmm. and from when I studied my kind of psychology undergraduate degree it wasn't really applied so it was kind of I learned lots about stuff but not really what to do with it mm. and I'm really interested in kind of doing stuff with stuff <laughs> that was my obviously experience as well with that sort of psychology yeah this mm. is all very interesting but what can we do to make mm-hmm. things better so yeah i i can think that was like i put a kind of a bit of a kind of knife to my tutor's heart when in in loughborough when they said to, at the end of it it's like how do you get on it's like i really enjoyed it but i don't i don't think it was very useful <laughs> 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 he just he just he just looked at me with this and he was just very kind of like and i it's probably years, yeah, yeah exactly it's probably who's this kind of idiot who's telling me this as well so it's probably probably wasn't the most empathetic thing to say but i meant i think it was just that i didn't really have an understanding of how to apply this stuff yeah whereas in melbourne and probably with experience but also how they structure the course was all around how you can bring this to life. Yeah. So I was, I set out thinking, right, I'm going to I'm going to test this at the University of Melbourne. This idea of John crafting. So I ran um, some lunchtime learning sessions. I didn't ask permission for this within the organisation. I just kind of did it, mm-hmm. and I just wanted to capture enough kind of data to kind of see what actually was a proof of concept here in terms of actually you can enable encourage people to to job craft. So all you're doing is effectively saying job crafting involves making small changes to kind of make your job even better. If I was to challenge you to make your job better, what would you do? Mm-hmm. And set a goal around it and see what come back in a in a month's time. And we'll, and I took survey um, data from some um, kind of validated studies and scales, and um, and it found it was really successful. And what we mm. found within within Melbourne, it was interesting. So you had people from te- technical staff to professors that would come and come to these sessions because I designed them not around job crafting, but saying, are you curious about how to make your job more fulfilling and interesting mm. and happier? come along to this lunchtime session and we I wanted to get um maybe 50 50 or 60 people there coming along and I kind of I think it was about 150 I had to stop coming you know <laughs> coming on because it was like it was getting bigger I couldn't hide the fact I was doing this kind of like in my <laughs> lunchtime um and I'm sure I could have got permission if I needed it to but I was just kind of it was just something I didn't I wanted to just make it happen and universities aren't always the easiest place to kind of make things happen um yeah. immediately so it was enough of like thought, oh, this is great I've got some data here People like this concept. I'm interested in this, applying this. And so when I came back to the UK, and we came back because for lots of different reasons, but primarily my mum's health wasn't brilliant. Mm. And it's a long way to kind of, um, to be away from my parents when they were kind of, when the health was a bit shaky, was to say, right, well, I can go back into an HR role, uh, or I could set up a business. And coming back from PwC, the consultancy side of things, mm. is something I, I enjoy doing. And Claire was, my wife was in the driving seat when we came back to the UK because she'd given up her job to come to Australia. Um, and she got one quite quickly when she was there, but she, it was a bit of a leap of faith for her. Um, so she got a job at Durham University. So we moved to the North East. So we didn't know anyone. So it was a very much a standing start. This was three, three, about three years ago where we are like, OK, so that's it. And I remember the first day of like my new life, as it were, going, 
okay, so I've got my own company now. What am I gonna? You know, what am I gonna do? I don't, you know, I don't know what that looks like. Um, and that's been kind of um, probably the same since, really, to be honest with you. Um, just making it kind of um, one, taking it one day at a time, and kind of developing things as we're going going along. So the uh, so the, so how I'm at the business now is around my passion and my interest is around working with organisations to um, bring. Um, the science and research and knowledge that we know from um, positive psychology and, and similar fields of behaviour science to, to bear within workplaces. So mm. actually, how can you create environments where people can bring their whole and best selves to the workplace from an evidence-based perspective rather than just saying it's a it's a nice thing to have on your kind of um, when you're trying to sell the organisation to, to, to employees. Mm. Um, and just encouraging individuals to, to just not kind of sleep work as it were kind of through their day where they're just doing the same things and the same patterns but actually reflect and thinking about are you working in the best way for you mm. are you able to bring your kind of innate unique talents to the to the fore on a day-to-day basis and that's the stuff that kind of excites me excellent mm. that was a very long answer to a very short question <laughs> <laughs> when i so when i think about things like when something new comes along, I mean, we get looks sometimes when we talk about action for happiness and people think it's all sort of, it's going to be incense burning and happy clappy. And I do want a gong though, <laughs> just to I stop do. people talk, talking. Yeah. So, so something like positive psychology, I can imagine such a term might strike fear in, in a business owner's mind. So what would be some of the sorts of evidence that, that's being shown as the positive effects and results and outcomes of of actually implementing something that's job crafting, that's taking all of this um, research on board. That's a that's an interesting question, and I think you're right in terms of striking the fear hmm. uh, into people's heart. And I've kind of been pro- deliberately a bit provocative in my job title in terms of chief positive deviant, in the fact mm-hmm. that it's quite a quick way of 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 working out which camps people are in. Kind of yeah. like so, those, those are like, oh my god, I'm, I'm going to run <laughs> for the hills. And there's others that kind of think, oh, that's that's fascinating. I, I love that. I want to tell me more about it. Mm. And it's so it's and I didn't design it in that perspective, but it's quite interesting to kind of get people into those different camps. Mm. And I think from my perspective, what we we know from in the workplaces is that the kind of our resisting the way that we stru- most people structure their work is based on what they, they've known or been taught about or seen working elsewhere, which is very hierarchical, which is very kind of the best knowledge and the best ideas always come downwards. So they come from the top and are cascaded down. And that you kind of keep a tight kind of control on what's, on what's kind of what's happening. And the best way to ensure the results that you want is by controlling and squeezing the kind of individuals, the areas of work that you're, to, to, that you're kind of working on, what you know, what you... Um, you could have measured there though, could have, that's how you get the results, mm-hmm. and that does work to a certain extent. We know that in terms of in terms of to, to, to a certain sense of outcomes, so that traditional model just works. But we also know that actually there is, from a research perspective, and from an evidence perspective, that there is. Well, I say I say we know. I need to challenge myself on that. So we there is there is a lot of kind of work out there, body of work out there that shows mm-hmm. consistently that actually organisations that have free range that really kind of give people autonomy control mm-hmm. and a clear purpose in terms of the work they're doing not only are those individuals more kind of engaged and energized in the workplace um but actually that links to kind of better performance as well and the best way i can kind of tangibly describe that i suppose is around an idea of discretionary effort so in terms of if you were to kind of go into anywhere in terms of um i don't know a customer service kind of interaction in a shop or something we we all know the difference between those people who who basically who don't, who are just there to get the money who don't really care about that interaction they won't maybe eye contact or they'll just kind of grunt give you good contact you. you and you'll do that so they're getting paid they're doing what they're supposed to do yes. versus the, those with the discretionary effort are kind of looking at you just you know with genuine interest and attention and saying kind of can I help you and, and interested about trying to make that experience better they're, mm-hmm. that discretionary effort. You know, and you see it everywhere within the workplaces in terms of I've seen something, I've seen a figure from a finance person that doesn't look quite right. You know, you've got a decision point there. Do you do, you do something about that? Do you use that in discretionary effort and explore it? It might take you a bit of time to do that. Or do you just let it go and just because just you know no one's really going to care about it? Mm-hmm. And that discretionary effort, I think, is the opportunity cost from, for businesses around where they generally want to create an environment where people can kind of flourish and thrive. So does that that discretionary effort matter to you as a business mm. and I'd argue it you know it should and it does mm-hmm. but not everyone necessarily kind of see, can see that mm-hmm. so it's depending on that's kind of how I would 
challenge people. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of specifically job crafting, there is now, so for the, for the book that I've kind of written, I had to kind of delve back into the research that mm. I studied when I was doing my master's in positive psychology. And there's now over kind of 140 peer review papers about job crafting, mm -hmm. which has shown, and then they're mixed in terms of the results, but overall in terms of a picture, it's showing that they're are kind of related to positive outcomes of people who craft their experiences, mm -hmm. who make work more than, mm -hmm. are more likely to have um, report kind of higher levels of personal growth and development from both a career um, and a skills development perspective, high levels of well-being, less levels of kind of burnout, high levels of resilience, mm -hmm. because it's linked into that element of control, at least that's what we think mm -hmm. is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and also in terms of performance as well. So one of the things that I, the studies I love that kind of links to this, and, and this is probably a little bit on this discretionary effort, is they reverse engineered, um, this was in India, in terms of a call centre from India, they followed up with some customers who were kind of in terms of satisfaction, and then they said who was the, uh, who were they most sat satisfied with in terms of their interactions, and then they matched those back with the individual's profiles of whether they crafted or not, mm. and the people who job crafted were statistically more likely to deliver better customer satisfaction mm. than those that, that weren't, and I think that, again, that ties, for me, it ties into that discretionary effort, <coughs> effort side of things. Could I hypothesize then that it could also have an effect on retention? So, for example, when I've seen, worked in corporate structures, when someone is not engaged, not really enthusiastic about the role, it's, for, so say, for a standard job description, quite similar tasks, irrespective of the company you're in. So sometimes a person will make a decision based on money. Well, it's not going to be any worse in company Y than my current employer therefore I'm going to go there for the extra money whereas I would hypothesize if I'm allowed to say well could I do little bits of this could I engage with this other team could I that would potentially I would say make me stay with the business rather than jump ship is that I like your hypothesis yeah I think it's really strong I think that one of the areas that I'm finding a lot of interest from from organizations are those that are trying to create sticky workplaces so they don't want people mm -hmm. to kind of to go or, mm -hmm. um, or particularly in with skill sets such as particularly in the northeast say for software engineers and thinking about and um, people within the tech area they're kind of actually how can we create environments where people want to stay mm. and we know that when people kind of feel that they're creating kind of personalized roles so the the ones that are kind of individual to themselves mm -hmm. they're less likely to want to kind of to kind of give that up or um or at least they think much more carefully about doing that rather than feeling they're going to walk into a kind of they, they know they won't be able to walk into the same role within a different organization so therefore it's an extra element of that in terms of both from a kind of retention perspective so in terms of creating a say a sticky workplace where people want to stay mm. but also maybe from an attraction perspective as well in terms of saying well you come here we can help you design your work around around you and there's a nice study that I kind of uh, often talk about when I'm out and about about this is called the IKEA effect. So if you the, if you um, get two groups of people um, to uh, well one, one group you get them to build an IKEA box and you ask them to value it, mm -hmm. and then the second group you have the box already pre-made and they come in and they inspect the box um, and then they value it. The difference between those group groups in terms of how they value it is. Is tends to be kind of significantly different, mm. and the reason it's different different is that the the builders value it up to, um, well, the study they did at Harvard showed that they're fifty percent more when they actually built it, which is actually counterintuitive because they've gone through effort and hard work to build the box in the first instance, whereas the second group just get to have you know to, to have the box without having to do that effort. Mm. It's, but they value it because there's still some of them within what they're doing, mm -hmm. and the same thing I think applies to to workplaces and jobs in terms of if you feel that you've created and crafted your job. Mm there's some of you within your job you'll value it more and therefore it doesn't mean to say you're never going to leave but it just means that, you, that, that the decision is maybe more more difficult and nuanced than it would be if you just not have that opportunity cool so we've mentioned the book a couple of times so what is writing a book what does that feel like uh, hard work so I think <laughs> I, I was like I had really well I didn't have that romantic I had well I had some romantic notions about this idea of writing a book that I would like <laughs> Um, not David Cameron esque, kind of like in a, um, a kind of like shed in his garden. I haven't got anything like that, but just this idea of kind of you see them on on films and things of people kind of sitting at a, um, a keyboard and effortlessly, kind of just writing stuff. And that wasn't my experience of the book, so mm. it was more, much more kind of like hard, hard graft, kind of bitty, um, 
lots of self-doubt lots of um kind of reflection and growth so a fantastic experience but but just tremendously kind of tremendously for me hard hard work it's not something necessarily i'd never define myself or describe myself as a writer so mm. it's something i feel like i can do mm-hmm. but it's something i have to kind of work at but but it but it happened and i think one of the thing, best things that happened for me was that i was lucky enough to, to work with a publisher and it was deliberately chosen part of the reasons i did that was that i knew that i'd have to kind of have clear deadlines i'd have some support with editing other aspects of it mm-hmm. and we had quite an ambitious deadline for this book so it was only March last year that we I, I got given the kind of the sign the contract and then it was delivered in September. Mm. Uh, well, that was kind of time for me because I still had a, a business to run at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, Evie was still very young and thin, and so life life was kind of there was no book sized hole in my life to to do it. <laughs> but but what, what I do know from doing this is that anyone can anyone could write the book. You know, I think if you've got a plan, if you if you kind of have the effort and the motivation to do it, you 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 can do it. And the purpose of the book for me is is around translating this the research and the evidence and science of, of job crafting to um for leaders for organizations to think about actually how they can create a more personalized kind of work experience why they should do it maybe why we haven't done it in the past mm. and the benefits of doing it and i i genuinely kind of i'm, I'm optimistic about the fact that you you see these statistics that um you know 60 to 70 percent of jobs in 10 years time ha- don't have an exist today mm. and people see that with dread and actually i see that with kind of potentially with lots of optimism in the fact that mm. if they don't exist we can design them and we why don't we design work around people mm. design it where people can really use their strengths and create great work rather than just the continued kind of drudgery in the way that we're doing it at the, at the moment yeah Great. Do, you, do you start with an idea just to write a book or have you started with an idea or an area of this area you're very passionate about and then decide to write a book what sort of yeah that's an d- interesting thing so I think different people use different people have different different aspects some people are like I've got a book in me I really want to write a book and that yeah. certainly doesn't that wasn't my kind of <laughs> me mm-hmm. um it's a bit of a cliche if you're kind of consultant sometimes that people because a lot of people do end up writing books so it's something that I kind of people have asked me about no, I was and I was interested, but I was curious about how people wrote books, and I was interested about because I consume, I read a lot of business books, and I'm mm. I'm fascinated by, by the process of it, and as someone, when I came from a running perspective, I'm always interested about understanding about training plans and how people, as well as watching people perform, I'm interested in how they got to that performance. Yeah. So I had spoken to a lot of people about writing books, and through those kind of conversations, a few people said. Mm well, maybe, you know, you should consider this, Rob. And so I thought about it. And a few people put me into, in contact with some publishers and I was very lucky to kind of get a couple of um, offers to kind of write books. And I, so I chose one and and that was it. So it was it's one of those things that happens with a lot of, and I, I call element, this element of crafting in itself, is the fact you kind of open up conversations and opportunities and thoughts to do something mm-hmm. and that creates kind of opportunities in the future to do things that you that I would that maybe would have been harder to do if I'd have just said right tomorrow I'm going to write a book. Mm-hmm. It's like that's actually quite hard. Mm. Was was I'd kind of unknowingly or maybe unconsciously I'd kind of I'd already done some a lot of mm. thinking or preparation about that process mm. and and made those kind of connections that made me kind of the opportunity present itself. Mm. Um, so it certainly wasn't it wasn't a kind of deliberate conscious. This is what I'm going to do, mm. but it was on, on reflection. I'd I'd kind of it's something I've been interest, you know, been interested in doing. Cool. So this is the section which does not have a name yet, and uh, James is going to take us away with the question number oh, one of I'm the quick starting. fire round. What is something you always wanted to do as a child, but never got to do it? Well, that's a really good question. I haven't been to the moon yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one thing mm-hmm. I think I wanted to to do. Um, and I don't, I don't know whether we will. I, went, I think with Finn, it, with my son, so he's like so five, it probably will be something that actually is something probably doable in his lifetime. Mm. I think people will be going to the moon in their lifetime, but not something I've I've done. So <laughs> I I, um, we, I think I would have probably mentioned that in my kind of my <laughs> <laughs> my, my potted history of my background. Was like, oh, yeah, and I went to the moon. Yeah, right. so, yeah. One so, Sunday, she yeah, thought, yeah. I don't know what I'll do. So no, I haven't, I haven't been to the moon. But the idea of kind of um, having a, a big adventure in terms of was something that I was uh, drawn to in terms of maybe... Um, doing an exp- expedition or something like that. So is that something I haven't done mm-hmm. yet in the kind of classical sense that mm. I've been thinking about about doing? So yeah, um, visiting somewhere scary and a bit adventurous. Awesome. Okay, so my question is, what is the strangest thing you've ever eaten? 
Oh, I get, well, I don't know. <laughs> this way, recently, one of my um, one of my friends, when we visited back in Australia, we um, she was um, a physiotherapist, mm-hmm. I know, um, massage therapist, and she, but she had kind of decided to kind of start a new business, I think, from a number of different business reasons. And the business she's doing is energy bars based on crickets. I knew so, that was coming. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what she was doing. So that's probably the the kind of um the strangest thing that i've eaten kind of recently and it, it tasted really good i recommend it i would i'd love to give a plug to the the energy bar but i can't remember them at the moment i'll, I'll send you after so you can put it in the show notes um but because uh, they're a great source of protein and things but they're, 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 they're i think it uh, and again our future probably involves a bit more of the kind of more sustainable mm. energy efficient cricket munching things like, so that cricket munching yeah mm. but they weren't they definitely didn't look like crickets and i she, i didn't only knew afterwards when she was asking for the taste and flavor which i thought was a bit mean of her yeah. so that she explained that, <laughs> that, 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 that the secret ingredient was um, was cricket yeah awesome <laughs> Third and final question: What makes you the happiest? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and some, as a positive psychologist, I should be able to kind of answer that mm. immediately. Um, but I, I also go back and go, "Oh, that's a very nuanced and difficult question to do." Um, so, quick fire. yeah, quick, a quick fire, a quick fire, a, a run, um, some time with family, um, a good film, a drink with friends. All those uh, makes me makes me happy. I'm very lucky. Kind of, I think also it's really useful to think ha- happiness in two perspectives. So one. Mm like how am I feeling now but overall so overall I'm really kind of generally very very happy mm. but on a day-to-day basis I'm sometimes I can be quite miserable <laughs> and um, um not all the time but sometimes I can and you know happy and I think that's one thing just to, to bear in mind is around mm. feeding both those elements of happiness it's mm. not your kind of just your immediate kind of like if I have this chocolate bar I'm going to be happy you like mm. you might be but it's maybe not sustainable for a long time mm. awesome so if we had the DeLorean parked outside and you can go back in it and speak to your 18-year-old self, take him for a run, <laughs> yeah. what advice would you give to him? Do you know what? And this is, and I, I don't know, I was thinking about whether this sounds arrogant or not. I don't mean it to be, but I wouldn't do it. I, like, I'm like. i quite really happy with kind of who I am and what, where I've ended up and mm. what I'm doing. And, and, and I've made loads of mistakes along the way and there's things I would have done with the experience I've got now differently in the past, but I, I just... I just get out of his way and just let him do what he, you know, what he's doing. So I wouldn't. I don't think I would go and visit my eighteen year old I'd just let him be. Ooh. I've never had that one no, before. No, I've had that before. But I was saying, I don't mean that. There's kind of like my life's perfect. It's definitely not perfect, and there's not you know, there's things that you could go back and tweak. But I'm I I don't think necessarily there's there's value in doing that. So I wouldn't well, do it. We'll have to go out and tell Doc Brown that he's, he's got no passenger to go back in time. Oh, I'd go back in time. I just wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't see me. Where, where about some little, time would you go? Oh, that's a good, that's a really interesting question. Um, whereabouts would I go back in time to? I think it would be quite kind of interesting to see, not necessarily visit myself, but just to see how I was acting and behaving maybe at Finn's age now at the moment. Mm. So I'd love to kind of see how... <laughs> There's elements of Finn that I can see in my... Well, I feel that I see myself, or people say they see me. Mm. I don't know if that's true. So it'd be kind of quite interesting to see that. And also, I don't appreciate how hard work it was for my parents to look after me. Mm. And I don't really remember that much from my parents. So I'd love mm. to kind of see um, see, see my parents, of kind of how they were kind of kind of loving and supporting me in the way that I never really probably appreciated as a, as a, as a four or five-year-old. Mm. That's awesome, well. Mm. So if that's of interest to the listeners, mm. whether it's the book, whether it's your business, what's the best way to find you? Oh, yeah. So thanks for that. So if people want to contact me, and I'm really always happy to open and share anything about some of the ideas that we shared on a very informal basis, you can contact me um, through Tailored Thinking. So it's tailoredthinking.co.uk. There is a website for the book, which is personalizationatwork.com, and you can spell that with a Z or an S in terms of personalization, whatever you're great domain name purchasing there yeah that was that was that was that was very lucky that they were kind of available so um yeah just just have a look and um and don't be shy to kind of get in touch awesome well thank you ever so much mm. for coming visiting inspiration north headquarters it's been it was a lovely day here and a great company and I, and I think i said uh, before we started i really appreciate someone as a as a listener to the podcast that i kind of benefit from the stuff that you that you do and i really kind of appreciate it and value it so thank you very much thank you thank you thanks everyone for listening check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person if you like this subscribe
subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody. <laughs>